let me introduce our speaker this week. But before I do that, I just want to remind everyone, um, check out the Nico Reading Group and Nico Data Science Nights um, and uh, look for more ways to participate. I think uh, there's a lot to be gained from those. Um, but to get to today's topic for our speaker, we have Neil Mangan, one of my colleagues in applied math here at Northwestern. She is a um, very impressive person. She's got funding from like every agency out there that you can get funding from. And uh, it's because she does great work. She's also worked on a million topics. I would say like her field of research could be described as complex systems or um, or nonlinear dynamics, data-driven modeling, I feel like is what she's going to talk about, I think. But um, but with applications, she's worked on applications to superconductivity, to synthetic biology, to uh, public health and epidemiology, semiconductor, semiconductor physics, all of amazing variety of research and all uh, very impressive stuff and fun stuff to hear about. So I'm looking forward to hear hearing about uh, the model selection she's going to tell us about today. So let's all welcome Neil. Great. Thanks. So happy to be here. This is a really fun audience. Um, I am going to, this is going to be like a direct follow-up on the Nico talk I gave, gave six and a half years ago when Luis invited me. Um, so uh, I'll basically be, so, okay, first of all, all of the various agencies on this slide contributed uh, to funding this work. So that's the first acknowledgement. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, my group. Um, but there's quite a few people who are not here on these slides who I'll acknowledge later who also were involved in this work, but this is the current group. Um, and as Danny said, we work on a variety of systems, although superconducting materials is a deep cut because I don't think I've done anything on that since undergrad. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, so currently we're doing a lot with biological networks. We have a pandemic project. We picked up the COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 dynamics in wastewater. Um, and then we're generally interested in model identification and we have a project in gene circuit design. Um, and Jithin, who is the first student I've had who's defended, defended last week, has done some work in chemical catalysis uh, and numerics. So most of what I'm gonna talk about today is the COVID project and um, the model identification project. In terms of methods development, um, the kind of overall picture that my group thinks about is here, which is we think about developing models from data, but in a very specific context, which is that there is potentially a large library of possible models we are interested in considering. And we have some data and we want to essentially use that data to down select to a smaller uh, number of possible models or mechanisms. And the thing we're, that I'm not super going to talk about today, but that we're really interested in moving forward is the problem of um, experimental design in this context of model selection, of how do you characterize the certainty, not just within an individual model, but between models, and then use that to suggest future experiments and refine the model and down select and do this iteratively. Um, so as I said, today I'm going to talk about a wastewater surveillance pandemic monitoring project and a um, project in developing these sparse model selection techniques. And these two pair together nicely because in some ways the wastewater surveillance project is sitting very much on the side of, uh, we wanted to do this super fast. It was the middle of the pandemic and we were trying to do something useful. And so we used what I would consider to be very traditional model comparison uh, approaches. And then the second part of the talk is like, okay, how can we do this in a, in a more interesting, more refined way, more powerful way using the type of optimization and computing um, that we, we have available, but takes longer to get everything working. Um, okay, so the big picture for wastewater surveillance is that we have six pe sick people contributing viral RNA to the sewer network. Um, that sample goes through the sewer and is collected in all the cases I'm going to talk about today at the wastewater treatment plants, but can also be collected at other locations um, within the sewer network. Uh, in our setup, those samples are sent to UIC and the Argon team um, at UIC, and they process those samples, and then they post the data for us on a spreadsheet. 
Um, and uh, mo the modeling team at Northwestern, that's primarily at Northwestern, but also has a component at Discovery Partners Institute, um, analyzes the data, does all of the things that we do, and then produces reports that get sent, sent to the public health departments, um, Illinois Department of Public Health and the Chicago Par Department of Public Health. And the, this project is paid for primarily. Uh, it was originally funded by the Walder um, Foundation, but is now paid for by IDPH and CDPH directly. Um, the team that has been involved in this is huge. So there's been a huge um, experimental team, a huge team just managing the project and designing the surveillance at DPI. Um, the modeling team here, uh, so Caitlin Leisman, most of the work I'm going to talk about today is work that she did. Um, more recently, there's been a, a team of undergrads that she's been working with who have started into picking up and expanding on this work. Um, Charlie Catlett is, uh, this is a slide that, uh, that Melissa, I think, designed, Melissa Pierce, who ran the program at DPI for a long time, designed. Um, she's called him the godfather of the thing. He's like the original person who wrote the grant and has just been like trying <laughs> to oversee and design everything. And then we do have, we also have a sequencing component, which I'm not going to talk about the sequencing at all. Um, but we look at the variants um, in the samples that are collected in addition to quantifying the concentration. Okay, so why would you want to use wastewater? So this is like the vision or the dream. And part of my stance on this is like, I had no idea going into this if this was going to be true for our data. I was highly suspicious. Um, but the dream is that this is an anonymous, inexpensive way to represent the viral state of an entire community. Um, that the data is not necessarily going to be the same as you would get from really high quality uh, surveillance, meaning like Sentinel surveillance, random testing, um, things like that. But it uh, can be used to make decisions about where to send more resources uh, because it does give you this broad snapshot. It also potentially, especially in the state we're in now, where we're doing less Sentinel surveillance, you know, a lot of the like really costly intensive testing programs or have been ramping down or have completely ramped down. Um, it gives a, it gives us another data source or a bit of insight when those clinical data are lacking or missing. And in certain cases, it has detected um, the pathogen in the wastewater before it before they show up at the hospitals. So one example of that is polio in New York in the summer of 2022. They actually saw it in the wastewater before they saw cases. So um, that that's the dream. And then there's the question of, OK, how do we actually get this to work with the type of data that we're collecting in Illinois? And one of the challenges and like the advantages and also the challenges of the data that we're collecting in Illinois is that the Illinois wastewater surveillance system made a conscious choice to try and get high coverage of all of the communities in Illinois across the state, in addition to all of the representative communities in Chicago. So this is a lot of samples spatially, rather than a lot of samples at certain locations. And so other uh, wastewater data that you may have seen in the news that has really, really high temporal resolution is from places like Massachusetts, um, in California, around Berkeley. Uh, there's, a, there's an auto sampler that takes like samples every couple minutes, uh, I think in Ohio, you know, like they have super high frequency data, but they're only doing it at one test, at one location that they're drawing the samples from. And so we had our, the trade off here was we wanted to cover more places, but we were only able to collect samples two to three times a week at those locations. And so that means we just have a much lower sampling rate um, temporally than, than the places where you can really like look at the curve and be like, ah, things are very smooth and tipping upward, right? We, we do not have smooth, nice data. Um, but the good thing is we're covering uh, 8.5 million people, about 70% of the residents. And I think there's some, I should know the statistic. There's some statistic like it's a dollar per person or something like that, which is pretty good compared to testing rates, but still very expensive, right? Um, uh, we also sample at like specific neighborhoods and a couple of discrete locations like the Cook County Jail um, and uh, O'Hare. So, and some a couple of Carrick facilities. I think at one point we did some pilots that were at particular schools. All of those data sets are tend to be very short um, and very very noisy. So I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about kind of our best, longest running, nicest data sets. Okay, so our goal is that we want to relate this wastewater to public health data. 
Um, and so here, here is a diagram of our overall system. And essentially we have sick individuals in gray contributing to the sewer network. Because Chicago has a, uh, a combined sewer system, other places they have a sewer system where only uh, say residential and commercial uh, facilities contribute to the sewer system and then precipitation is separate. But in our sewer system, everything is going into the same network. So it's really, really noisy, really, really potentially messy, um, complex flow thing with varying chemistry happening in here. Um, this goes out to the wastewater treatment plant right at the inlet of the wastewater treatment plant is where they collect the samples, they get frozen and they're sent to the lab. And this project would not be possible without all of the mini uh, 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 wastewater treatment plant um, partners who collect these samples and send them to the lab where that part of what they're doing, they do for free. So we're not paying them for the labor of conducting these additional samples. Um, so all of, the, uh, all of the samples I'm gonna talk about today are from MWRD, which is the um, wastewater uh, reclamation district that covers um, Chicago land, basically. Okay, so at the lab, uh, there's some process, it's basically a quantitative PCR process that, um, sam that analyzes the sample and determines gene copies of RNA per liter of wastewater. So that's the unit that we get. And um, the other information that we have is, you know, at least in terms of how many people are sick or some estimate of what the prevalence in the community is, comes from um, public health data. So this data also has its own problems. It's dependent on whether people decided to go get tested or not, whether they did, you know, what, what the dynamics of the disease are at the certain time, when how many people have to go to ho the hospital or not, right? So there's all that this um, data can have its own issues. But our goal would be to be, you know, it is also the best data we have in terms of a separate picture of what the uh, what the state of the disease in the community is. So we would like to be able to connect these two things together. Um, and yeah, I just want to draw attention. Hospitalized people does not equal sick individuals, but it's basically the best uh, indirect data we have. So, um, okay. So as a modeler, when I first looked at this problem, I was like, well, there are so many models we could build. Like we could, if we really want to understand this problem, we should like have an SEIR dynamic model. We should have a model of the shedding dynamics of how much people actually are going to contribute into the sewer system. We need like a, 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 a very complex network model for the flow in the sewer system with stochastic particle transport. Uh, Aaron Packman was really excited about adding in stochastic particle transport, which we have not done. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and then you have like potentially a behavior model of how people, which could be changing over the course of the pandemic in terms of people doing much less testing, right, as it as it becomes more endemic. Um, and then the, maybe a lab process error model uh, to understand as they change the laboratory methods, how did that change our ability to recover and quantify the RNA? We were in the middle of the pandemic, so, you know, spinning up all of these models, uh, not going to happen. So we said, okay, well, what can we do? Can we do a simple connection between um, direct the type of data we directly have? So skip all the stuff in the middle. <laughs> can we learn a model that will help here? And, and the question was, okay, also, what, what information do we have about this whole complex system? Well, we had basically three things that we thought were pretty reliable and were used pretty consistently in the literature. We had um, a fecal load indicator, which is this pepper mild mottled virus which is basically everybody eats peppers and tomatoes and this virus grows on peppers, not everybody, but most people eat peppers and tomatoes. This, this thing grows on peppers and tomatoes and so everybody contributes it. So it gives you some indication of the contribution of the population, like the population's contribution um, to the sewer in the particular unit of wastewater, right? Uh, we also had the flow rate. It's the in rate at the wastewater treatment plant. So you can imagine as that would matter in some way as uh, the sewer, um, you know, depending on if you have precipitation or not, for example. And then we had a lab recovery control, which was attenuated bovine coronavirus. It's basically coronavirus, but for cows. And what they do is when the sample gets to the lab, they spike it in, in a known amount. And so that bovine coronavirus goes through the entire lab process in the same way that, um, everything that was already in there, both the PMMOV and the SARS-CoV-2 RNA do. So it gives you 
a lab recovery control that is like sample specific. Because you can imagine each sample is some messy, complex, different chemical media, and the amount of RNA you can recover from it is going to be different. And so at least in terms of uh, what the sample sees from when it gets to the lab onward, this gives you like a, a, a control for that. All right. So what people had done in the past or common in practices in this field were essentially to take First of all, they almost all only looked at case data. There was very little comparison. It, it, there was in some case, in some locations, but for the most part, they didn't look at hospitalizations or test positivity rate or other types of public health indicators. And the reason is because cases tended to A, be a thing that was really readily accessible and B, um, you know, when you are trying to determine if you have upticks in prevalence in a community, cases are often the first warning sign because it's something that gets collected faster than the time delay in which it takes for people to get to the hospital. Another common thing to try and correct for the dynamics in the sewer system was to multiply by flow. So you no longer had gene copies per liter, you had just gene copies. Um, another thing people would do is they divide by PMOV to try and correct for variation in the population. Um, and often the recovery control was not used as like, a oh, you take the percent recovery and multiply or something like that. It was used as a filter. So if you had super low recovery, you would just throw that sample out. So you can see these are kind of, for the most part, except for maybe B-Cove with the other things, using all of these different measurements independently, right? Not combining them together and seeing if they each give you some different information on how to correct the model. So... What we wanted to do was understand, uh, could we use all of them together? Would that improve things? And, or should we only use a subset of them? And how should we use them, right? But, so we decided to train a power law model and we're definitely not the first person to use a power law model. I think the thing that's slightly different, it's not very common, but it, we didn't do it first. Uh, but the thing that's slightly different about what we did is we really did um, a more uh, rigorous, job in thinking about the model selection of which power law model to use. And we also spent some time thinking in terms of dimension analysis about what the power law model meant, which we had not seen before in the literature. Okay, so here's what our data looked like. Uh, it comes from O'Brien, Calumet, and Stickney, which are the, you can see the wastewater reclamation areas in the colors. And then Chicago is outlined over it. So you see that these wastewater um, catchments uh, actually cover much more than just Chicago, and they also don't tend to line up exactly with municipal boundaries, which makes comparing data interesting, um, because all of your epi data, epidemiological data like hospitalizations, cases, all of those things comes from um, the, the boundaries that are kind of municipal boundaries, whereas the wastewater comes from where are the pipes, right? Um, so, and then this is what the data looks like. Uh, I'm plotting it not on a semi-log scale. Everything else you'll see is gonna be on a semi-log scale, but you can see like very noisy. Um, this is 20, uh, November, 2020, all the way to um, January, 2022. You can see one of the spikes and then a large spike here. We do have data past this, but we changed lab methods conveniently right in the middle of an outbreak. And so, <laughs> so I'm gonna stop uh, before our lab, the lab methods uh, at UIC changed. Um, all right, so what did we do? So we developed this development and selection pipeline. And so the first thing we did was we generated what we could think of as the most general physically based wastewater model, which is this power law model. Um, then we collected a set of prevalence estimates. So this was all of the uh, public health data that we had available. Um, and part of our goal was to see, okay, you know, you can't usually get fast hospitalizations in real time, but they're more accurate generally. So how does that compare if we use hospitalizations versus cases versus test positivity rate versus beds in use, for example? Um, and, and thank you very much to the public health departments for uh, sharing their data and working with us. To, it, it's like a huge thing every time they handed us a data set because it was just very tricky to like do all the corrections they needed to try and get the best data set possible. Curating the data is not a, not a simple task. Um, okay, so this is our, the basis of this dimensional or physical analysis model. So we're basically trying to estimate the prevalence, so the number of infected people over the total population. 
And we have, we are measuring viral concentration. So we're saying, okay, what is the relationship between viral concentration, which is in gene copies per liter, to infected people over total people? Well, we can do the same thing many people have done, multiply by the sewage volume to get to gene copies. We want to uh, divide by a viral shedding rate. So that gives us gene copies per infected person. Um, we have a viral recovery rate, which is dimensionless, but we need to correct for the amount that's actually being recovered in the lab. And then we have the contributing population. So if we multiply all these things together, we get the right units of infected people over total people. But we're not measuring any of these things directly. We're measuring these things. So we're measuring SARS-CoV-2 extracted from the wastewater, this fecal load indicator, PMMOV, and uh, B-CoV and the flow rate. So then we needed to say, okay, well, how can we estimate each of these physical quantities in this dimensional analysis, simple dimensional model from these things? And I'm going to skip the derivation, but basically we ended up getting to this power law, which relates the SARS-CoV-2 flow, PMMOV, B-CoV recovery, and some constant, which the constant is doing a lot of work. It's essentially making the work units work out because we have these powers. So our units are no longer exactly the same. So there's this... You may be dubious of this, uh, that's reasonable, but we have, because we've worked through this, the benefit is that we can actually make interpretations of what these powers should physically be. So some of them should be strictly positive and some of them, for example, flow could be positive or negative, but depending on which it is, it kind of has a different physical interpretation of how flow is changing things, yeah. Is there any argument that the uh, amount of way that PMMOV changes over time? I, I would imagine that people maybe eat more tomatoes in the summer than yeah. in. Um, are those corrections? And so that's the first one. And the second one is related to flow. And if there is memory in there, right? Does a big thunderstorm wash away right away? Or do you see the effect for longer time? So, so the answer is that I could give a talk on every single one of the problems with every single one of these variables that would be the entire hour. And so, so yes, like things, things are bad. The question was, could, could we make it work? by doing this, right? Like, would this improve things? And, but I, I, you know, it's like when I talk to the sewer systems people, they say, oh, well, flow must be really important, right? But you could imagine that, that if, so there's kind of two main effects. If your flow is faster, if you have higher volume flow, you may think you're collecting more, but you also get a dilution effect. And those are two counter effects. And so it's really unclear that flow is going to be informative. Uh, I think the answer is yes, probably there's variation in PMMOV uh, at some level. Um, I believe we've looked at it temporally and there's not significant variation. Just say instantaneous, right? Yeah, and... and uh, I mean, I think I think one of my basic feelings about this whole system is things are really bad and I'm going to be very surprised if anything works. That was what I how I went into this, which you can tell from the fact that I'm talking to you that something worked. Right. Um, uh, otherwise, I would have maybe like given you two slides in the morning about working on really complex public health projects in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so so that's the model. And then what we did was we actually want to select and fit submodels. So here's just a, a, what that means is that we're taking that big model and we're setting a bunch of the powers to zero. We also have simplified versions of this where we don't fit a power, we just say we're normalizing. So we're, we're gonna have those powers equal to one. So when we do this, I've now forgotten how many models we have, but we also have the freedom of the lag between the data sets. So in addition to all of these different possible models that are essentially including or not including certain terms, we also have uh, 21 lags because we allow the data, the lag between the data to be between, you know, like the, the temporal alignment, right, between the data sets to be negative uh, 10 to 10 zeros in the middle. So that's 21. And then we have um, uh, four prevalence indicators that we ended up comparing against. So uh, test positivity cases, hospital admissions, and beds in use. So altogether, that ends up being just over a uh, 1,000 models that we end up um, fitting. Uh, this is just a linear regression once you put these into log space. So it's very easy to fit a 1,000 models. Um, uh, 
Uh, so we take those thousand models and the, then we're going to evaluate them. And we check them for robustness, um, which is essentially not, we didn't really do bootstrapping, but it was taking out chunks of the data and testing and seeing if those, that caused issues. And then we all, we did in-sample evaluation using uh, AIC and out-of-sample evaluation uh, validation also using AIC. We basically saved the last part of the data to see if we could predict the last uptick or not better with this model. Um, and the model is basically taking the wastewater measurement and mapping it to whichever prevalence indicator we have, right? So it's not that we're trying to predict the future from just the past, we're predicting the future from the model that we've trained and also the wastewater data at those points. Okay, so and just if you haven't seen AIC, what it does is if you have models um, and you increase the number of terms in those models, you would expect more terms are going to reduce the error in your model. Uh, but at some point you're fitting to noise and AIC gives you an information theoretic way to penalize extra terms. And so it essentially like penalizes those terms. And so you have a metric, which at least theoretically picks out the, the most parsimonious model. Although in actuality, we're interested in looking at the set of the models, which are below some threshold in this, this parsimony. Okay, so we did that. And uh, this is basically all the different models are on X. The lag, wastewater lag, is on Y. And then each of these little blocks is a different prevalence indicator. So you can see like cases you have, uh, and then the color is the relative AIC. So how well within each of those chunks the model is doing against all of the other models in that set. So cases, this is uh, essentially the best model, but there's some blurriness in, I basically if it's kind of like yellowy gold, maybe it's not so bad because remember it, it like this is fitting to very noisy data so maybe uh maybe we should consider all of those guys um tpr uh picks something with a more reasonable lag these lines are what we decided was physically reasonable lag but one of the reasons we went outside that was because we wanted to know do we occasionally get spurious fits that are not physically reasonable um, which you tend to get for cases which is again what most people were using for comparison um County bed is in use and our favorite hospital admissions. Uh, and so you see in the hospital admissions one, we're actually we're getting low values for the model with all terms, but also the model with um with bovine and coronavirus and PMMOV and uh the one with flow and BCOV. Um so the takeaways from this are for the prevalence indicators that we trust more, like hospitalizations. Everything is within what we think are reasonable physical lags. Um, it's pretty robust across prevalence indicators, meaning that the models that are in gold are kind of consistently co selected across them. And um, uh, it's also consistent in sample and out of sample AIC. So I have not yet told you this last one is out of sample AIC for hospital admissions. And you may say, okay, well, now your which model is selected, which one is the most gold has switched. It's now no longer the one with all terms, but actually that one did have relatively strong statistical support. And so my interpretation of this would be that in sample, that one was the all terms model was being overfit, but by doing out of sample, we were able to determine that the, the second best model in the all terms or in the in sample data is more likely the one with statistical support, yeah. Um, good question. Positive lag means wastewater is first. So, which is good for hospitalization data, bad for purportedly what's going on with cases, <laughs> which is also, I think, I think I have that right. Caitlin maybe is online to yell at me. Yeah. You have a Yes, out, out of sample, there's not enough data to estimate the lag parameter. And that's actually, so we we originally weren't even trying to do out of sample because we didn't think we could, like we didn't think we had enough data to do in sample and out of sample data training. Um, some pushing from the reviewers on our paper made us revisit that, which was really good because then we got this picture and uh, they, you know, I think basically what my takeaway is in sample, 
we use a lot more data to train. And so there are things about that that are reliable, but you still need that out of sample to help you figure out when you have these spurious correlations and differentiate between fitting to noise and not. So AIC helps you because it tells you many of these models are equivalent rather than different, but it doesn't solve it. Like out of sample testing is always better. Okay. Uh, and cases are less reliable. So if you can, you should fit or fit things to hospitalization data. All right, uh, <laughs> here is another slice of the plot. So now I'm just picking for the I, for a particular lag or the best lag. So I've removed lag from it. You can see that uh, all of our power law models do much better than what we're calling basic models, um, at least on the in-sample data, which also makes sense because the in-sample data is when we're training the power laws. Um, Basic models here just means that you're you're dividing by PMMOV or you're multi you know you're dividing by B code so it's just no powers anymore just normalizing by things. Um, the other thing that we can see is that or one of the main things we learned from this plot is our most supported model, which you also saw on the previous slide, is this one that has B code and PPM, PMMOV. Almost as good is just using B code. And this is kind. This is consistent between both the uh, out of sample and in sample data. And it's likely that if any time we include flow, we're overfitting, and the amount of noise in the flow data is just outweighing any benefit that it might have, at least at this level of modeling. Um, so this is a little counter to what was in the literature previously. People were not using BCOV to correct directly at all. Um, that they were only using PMMOV for this particular data set, uh, PMMOV does not really help. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I claim everybody should go do what we did. What I claim is that everybody should take this pipeline and actually text test a comparison between the different models that they could potentially use on their data. All right. I think that if you don't just celebrate, just go home. Right. Like, why would you need some help? Right? Okay, I want to get to the second half of my talk. Um, all right, so uh, here's the snapshot of how much does it look like we actually improve across the time series of the data set. So the pink dots are hospitalization data, the gold triangles are the raw wastewater data, and the uh, blue squares are the train the wastewater data pushed through this trained model. So in particular, you can see within our data our validation set, the um, uncorrected data is really high compared to the hospitalizations, but the trained one is good-ish, captures when the uptick has happened, undershoots. And there's really nothing we could necessarily do about that undershooting because the dynamics of this particular outbreak were probably intrinsically different than the dynamics of the previous ones. Overall, looking at um, root mean squared between hospitalizations predicted by the model. So we have in sample, um, the corrected wastewater versus the raw, out of sample, corrected wastewater versus the raw. And then we did we applied the model that we had to three smaller locations where we didn't have as much data, and we still saw an improvement. And those three smaller locations, the only thing we did was retrain the, the uh, constant term. So there is a transfer learning thing, I mean, baby transfer learning thing going on where we use the power laws from the previous one and then use uh, the retrain the constant. All right. The thing we're currently doing is, okay, we had this lab transition going from low throughput to high throughput. So there's a question of what changes in the model. The answer is actually now PMMOV matters and BCOV doesn't. Interesting. Um, and then we also would like to uh, do all of these other things that are interesting from a modeling perspective now that we're not like constantly under pressure to report. I mean, we still report weekly to the public health departments. And by we, I mean, Caitlin, because I don't do any of that. Um, uh, but, you know, we're thinking about how to do all of these other other components of modeling. Um, so that's the first bit. If you don't mind, I'm going to plow right ahead. Uh, I guess I should pause. Are there any questions from not Luis? <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, I will be I will. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's basically that the relation, so if we look at, um, say, PMMOV versus SARS-CoV-2, the raw data, it looks like a power law. It does not look linear. And so it's because, like, one way that you could have a power, eh, 
it's complicated exactly why, but basically it, it could be something about um, differences in shedding rates, differences in how they behave in the sewer system, like how they stick to stuff, uh, differences in, the, but it, but I mean, what is a power law? A power law is just saying the more of it you have, the stronger the effect is going to be. And so it's, from the data, it's intrinsically not linear. Um, yeah. And there's lots of reasons that that could be. Yes. Uh, in that model validation plot as a function of time, uh, is that one time step prediction? Do you have any? No, it's just taking the time point and pushing it through this power, this power law model. So there's no forward, there's no future prediction happening at all. Yeah, it's just it's just so the 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 model right is just trying to figure out how much noise is coming from the wastewater system changes in the population right like it so it's just I you can think of it like as a correction model it's just trying to correct the model the data the wastewater uh, measured SARS-CoV-2 data for noise. No, that's what so you that you're thinking way too complicated. <laughs> like literally, it's just like an error model for the the noise that's coming from the wastewater system. There's no future prediction prediction at all. Now that would be that's what we would actually like to do is future prediction, right? Especially as we move to a place where we don't have good hospitalization data to compare against. We would we would like something where we can say, okay, if I have past SARS-CoV-2 RNA values, can I predict future SARS-CoV-2 uh values because I don't have other data to compare against and I just want to be able to predict the time series. Um, but yeah, we aren't, we are currently doing that. I do not have anything to show you. Yeah. And really the thing to do is to train an SEIR model and then use the SEIR model, which is what Dave Morton's team has been doing. Okay. So all of you have fallen asleep because you came for the data and then bottle selection portion can wake up. Um, I will skip past various random applications. All right, so a big a thing that my group thinks about a lot in a number of different application contexts is can we build dynamical systems models from data? And the challenge for a lot of systems is not that we don't know what types of underlying physics or chemistry or biology we could have, but that we don't know which ones are important. So for example, if we wanted to build um, ODE models of the system's biology variety, we might be interested in uh, testing all possible connections within the network and dynamical interactions within the network. So you know, the full possibility might look something like this, where we have a set of for you know just three variables, three couple ODEs, where each of for mass action kinetics, right, each of these terms is telling us something about who interacts with who and in what way. So if I take this, this simple or this particular connection model, there's actually multiple ways that those connections could be represented. So here's one subset, here's a different subset. Um, and if I look at all of the possible uh, models for every possible set of connections and type of connections out to second order polynomials, so just three populations, that quickly blows up to being 10 to the nine subset models. So the challenge is how, you know, okay, what I did in the last one was I just did the combinatorics of all the models I wanted to compare. Now I'm doing dynamical systems. Things are not just linear regression. Sometimes I have hidden states. Computation is getting a lot more expensive. It quickly becomes impossible to calibrate and validate 10 to the 9 models. Uh, although Cody is trying to do it. Um, <laughs> maybe not 10 to the 9. I don't remember what you're uh, anyway, okay, so one framework for thinking about this is sparse model selection, and Cindy, um, which I worked with Steve uh, Brunt and Josh Proctor and Nathan Kutz when I was at University of Washington before coming here, uh, this is stuff they did without me, though. The basic idea is you have data generated from some dynamical system, so it's essentially, say, concentration of some things over time. Um, you can build a linear library of all the possible nonlinear functions, so these are just going to be polynomial terms, where the only thing that's unknown is these coefficients. And then you can just turn it into a linear regression problem if you're able to estimate the, the derivative. So we just have the derivative with the time series plugged in is equal to an unknown coefficient vector times a matrix, which is each of the polynomial terms with all the data plugged in. So we just have AX equals B, and we're estimating X. And the only thing that's new is that we're going to estimate that coefficient vector, assuming that most of those terms should be zero. 
So most of those uh, coefficients should be zero. There's a relatively simple, dumb way to do this, which, it, which works incredibly effectively, which is to alternate between your simplest uh, optimization least squares and thresholding. So do a linear fit uh, and then threshold out anything that's small. Only keep the terms that were non-zero, do the linear fit again, threshold out anything that's small. And when you do that, um, you don't know ahead of time what your threshold should be. So if you vary that threshold or that sparsity enforcing value, you're going to uh, decrease the number of terms that are in the model. And you end up with something that looks like this, like a Pareto front type thing, which says, okay, now I need to go back and evaluate which of these models, which is my best model for each. Sparsity is the one that I, I or the set that I think might be useful. Um, and then you can come up with your favorite or your set of favorites um, and reconstruct the model. Okay, so the problem with this particular method and the reason that I couldn't just apply it to all the systems I'm interested in, or at least one problem, is that we can't actually measure everything. So this is just a diagram of one of the metabolic networks that um, Andre Archer and my group has been working on. And um, this system is not necessarily sparse in what I've drawn here, but there is only a subset of this that is actually important <laughs> during a particular experiment. And so we can still frame this as a down-selecting from a large potential a model. And this is also not everything that could be going on. So often we have problems that this could be also interacting with other things um, that are in the network that we don't even know about. And so hypothesizing all the possible terms that it could be interacting with, but then using a sparse uh, pressure to down-select, I think would be an interesting strategy, but we also can't measure everything. Okay, so what do we do when we can't measure everything? Um, so now you can imagine this thing is like Lorenz, and it's producing... Uh, time series data, but we're only able to, you know, the underlying system is three-dimensional, but we're only able to measure a subset of those terms. And H here is my measurement function. You don't have to remember the notation, but we're going to do the same sort of strategy where we formulate a library of all the possible terms that can be on the right-hand side of the ODEs. And we're also going to assume that we know the dimension of the system. So this was work that was pushed by uh, Helena rivera Ponza, who was a postdoc in the group and um, Dr. Sasha Sherman and Julie. Um, okay. So in this setup, we need to simultaneously estimate the model structure. So which of our terms should be there or not, which P's should be zero or non-zero, what those non-zero parameters are, and the entire trajectory of the hidden variable. Okay. Um, and we can do this by minimizing this negative log likelihood function, um, which has three components. It has a measurement error term, a model error term, and a sparsity term. And this particular uh, method comes out of the, the data assimilation literature for chaotic systems. So it what the reason we picked it is because it does, without the sparsity term, it does a very, very good job of estimating parameters for chaotic systems. Um, and this is basically what the breakdown of this cost function does. So if you just look at variational annealing, um, and the reference is down there, then the measure, if you start with your uh, model error term turned off, so RF is set to zero, then you have a very nice non con or a very nice convex cost function because you just have your measurement error. You're just measuring the error on things, the predicted uh, values of the terms and the things you can measure. As you turn up RF or dial in that model error term, your cost function gets spikier and spikier and develops more and more local minima. Um, but you can do a variational or an annealing approach where you start at the minimum of the previous point and then reinitialize over and over to stay near that global minima in your landscape. Um, and we put on top of this a stochastic interior point method. And so you actually end up sampling many, many points in the landscape, but you generally are sampling them near that, uh, the minima that was defined earlier by your data. Um, okay. Then what we did was we added on the sparsity term um, and it does the same thing that it did. You know, So now we have a much more fancy uh, parameter estimation method, but we're still going to just apply sparsity. Um, and what that's going to do is going to force the parameters to zero. So here's just one parameter. And as we increase our sparsity, it's going to push that one to zero. Okay. And so here's something that the output looks like. So here is my uh, thresh. It actually is a threshold in the algorithm, not a, ver uh, 
not we're not using a lasso style uh, thing, but so we have this threshold. And for each value of the threshold, we do this variational annealing thing. And because again, it's a stochastic method with many seeds, we get many, many different models out. Each dot represents a model. Um, sorry, y-axis is number of active terms. So each dot is representing a different model, a different number of active terms. Um, and, but as we increase that threshold, the whole there's pressure on the whole system and the models get simpler and simpler in the same way in aggregate. Um, I'm not showing you cost function, but the light gray and the dark gray or light gray and dark gray, there's a gap in the cost function. So there's some models that are clearly better than others, at least at the noise level that this was done for. And uh, the blue are the ground truth. So we validated this on synthetic uh, time series simulated from the Lorenz system where we actually knew it. We figured, you know, got everything working. And then we tested on experimental data and we went and found the nicest experimental data we could find which was data from a circuit that was built to produce behavior like the Lorenz system. <laughs> so like, if it wasn't gonna work on this, <laughs> bad news bears, right? So uh, this is the circuit, and this is from Blakely et al. in uh, 2007. Um, they measured the voltage at certain points in this network. And in this data set, they did not have access to the to Y. So they only can measure X and Z, or at least they only reported X and Z. They didn't put, uh, so, we, so we have exactly the system that we were set up for, which is two, well, some number of measured variables, a couple, and, and then a hidden variable. Here's the time delay embedding X, X at some time delay times Z. So you can just see this data it does look like a Lorenz attractor. Um, the, this time series is what we actually used to train. So we didn't use the amount over here. We used the amount over here data. Also super high frequency data, uh, you know, really nice data. Okay, so what did we get out? We got out these models. Um, we did cross validation on a whole heck of a lot more data uh, that, that we had from the, the data set that, um, that the authors kindly sent us and had saved since 2007. Um, and uh, okay, so we got this set of models and then we declare victory because one of them is Lorentz. <laughs> but, but we put an asterisk on that victory. And why do we put an asterisk on that victory? Well, uh, so I'm just showing you all of the models produce very similar time series, uh, especially out to a Lyapunov exponent of this chaotic system. They all have very similar error. Um, and if we actually do cross validation using again, AIC as our metric for this out of, or our indicator for this out of sample data, we actually find that two more complex models have more statistical support, our, our gold and our salmon colored models, than the other models that we found. Okay, so how should I interpret this? Should I be happy? Should I be sad? Well, my eternally optimistic take on this is that um, the method is doing what it was intended to do. It is suggesting additional terms that could be in the model. And if we were better at handling, elect handling electronic circuits, we would go in and figure out if these terms are real. I also claim it's very, very possible that they are because this electron, the electronic circuit, circuit that uh, Blakely et al. produced to get to show that it produces Lorenz-like behavior, you know, they derived this, this system of equations here by hand and they made a series of assumptions that parasitic resistances and other things were negligible, right? And so it's totally possible that what we've discovered is the set of terms that may best represent those terms that they considered to be negligible when they did their by hand derivation, but turn out to maybe not quite be negligible. Um, so I still declare victory uh, and I'm very happy with this, but it, it, you know, I would never wanna say these terms are definitely real without being able to go in and do an experiment to confirm. Um, it, it's creating a hypothesis. Um, okay, so then this is the new thing that is not in the paper. Um, so this is work that uh, Andrew Inglethal and Cody, who's in the back of the room, mentored Andrew on this. Sorry, Cody, I last minute was putting pictures on the slide. Um, and, but basically, Cody is really interested in hibernation. And so he and Andrew, uh, over the summer, found this data, which is metabolic, uh, it's actually temperature data measured from a hibernating Arctic ground squirrel. And um, this, the, it's crazy. Like this animal has this crazy behavior. This is its body temperature being up at normal temperature. The external temperature declines. So the, in, you know, its body temperature drops while it's hibernating. It has all these spikes. At some point it drops to negative four Celsius. 
and it kind of sits there and it keeps spiking back up crazy, 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 crazy behavior, right? Um, so they looked at this and, and, you know, one of Cody's big interests and goals is to try and find models that would help us understand and characterize this behavior, not just for Arctic ground squirrels, but across many different hibernating animals, this ground squirrel happens to be, have like good characteristic high resolution data. So we said, okay, uh, and, and Andrew and Cody embarked on this mission of like cap gathering every set of equations they could find from the literature and all of that sort of stuff. But we also wanted to take the data-driven approach. And so we said, all right, well, let's take this data and put it through DAISY, the algorithm that we just designed, and see what we get out. This is what we get out, sort of, asterisk. Um, <laughs> so uh, what they found is this, this model, which has exactly the sort of spiking uh, behavior that they were looking for, which is good. Um, it also, and I'm not going to have time to go through this totally, but it also is consistent with a depleted uh, metabolite hypothesis, which Cody actually, were there existing models associated with the delete? No. Okay. So there was no existing model associated with the depleted metabolite hypothesis, but the idea is basically that you have some metabol you turn metabolism on when, you know, so the temperature goes up and then that you have some metabolite that's produced, it slowly degrades away. And when it falls below a certain threshold, it's the, the animal wakes up again. Okay. So this was the hypothesis and one of the hypotheses in the literature about how this is controlled. And we found a model that like perfectly uh, mimics this. Now it's a simple model. There's a lot we're not capturing. We're not claiming this internal state that we found is necessarily uh, exactly some particular metabolite, right? It's like an effective state. But it was really cool to see a potential model come out that matched one of the hypotheses in the literature. Um, I'm also showing you the flow field, and the the caveat here is that the current uh, way that we're doing our model selection it has trouble recovering small parameters because it's thresholding things out. And so what Andrew actually found was this model, but without these two small terms. And those, what those small terms are needed is like, if you don't have them in your phase plane, you get the spiking behavior and then it gets stuck at zero and just stays there. And so in order to kick the system past zero and re-spike, you need these small terms. Um, we did go back and look, like, before you do the thresholding, Daisy does find a model that has these terms, but it maybe also has some other terms you don't want. So th there's a little bit of, uh, so first of all, it motivates the need, um, not that we didn't, we, we already knew this, but it motivates further the need to make Daisy more robust in finding small terms. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're now exploring, okay, what else does Daisy spit out besides this thing? And, you know, what, what else can we learn from that class of models? So uh, I think I, I should mention contemporaneous with the um, with the method that we made. There's been a number of other methods that kind of came out con contemporaneously slash we beat them very slightly. Um, and uh, they there's kind of been two different methods. One uses time delay coordinates. The other uses um, optimization using the system of equations. Um, there's subtle differences between these things. Our method is most close to this method um, from a, a group at MIT. Um, and we've, we've been talking to George about what the actual difference is. The main differences are the optimizer that's used. Um, and they do an ensemble strategy and we're not currently doing an ensemble strategy. Um, okay, so the last thing I wanna say is that this method works really well for oscillatory and chaotic data and really terrible for transients to fixed points. <laughs> And most of the metabolic systems I'm interested in just are transients to fixed points. And so the thing we've been thinking about a lot lately is what's the difference between these systems. Uh, metabolic and regulatory systems tend to be have identifiability issues. So they have completely different structure in their cost functions, regions that are very fat, flat with equivalent solutions lying in them. And so um, this is also getting us back not only to the to potentially needing to use different optimizers that are going to be more robust in searching flat landscapes, but also um, to thinking about experimental design. Because if you can't differentiate between multiple solutions, maybe what you actually need to do is not make you know find a better optimizer, but get more data so that you can. Um, and that's where I will stop.
that we already had a number during the talk. We got time for a few more. Sure. <laughs> go ahead, please. <laughs> um, so I'll go back to this is not a question, it's a suggestion. Um, I think it would be interesting to have some calibration over for the tomato and uh, pepper thing. Uh, because the idea why the calibration is important is because those things change from time to time. And so when you are doing the quantitative PCR, it's like they are competing with different things. And your calibration, I think, works well for COVID-19 because of you are using something that probably is relatively similar and gives you the same thing, but it would not be clear that you would not need a different calibration for the pepper thing. Um, so I'm a big fan of calibration. Um, the, the, the thing about the, the flat landscape, uh, and when I was looking at problems in which there is a flat landscape, one of the problems was that it was flat in the sense that whatever you start, your guesses are terrible and almost anything that you do gets you nowhere better. And one strategy that we used was making the problem simpler. And by making the problem simpler, you kind of have to consider fewer solutions and stuff like that. So have you considered kind of, if you have a bunch of, data that you are putting in and you are trying to kind of describe all of them at the same time plus the hidden stuff maybe too much and kind of kind of find a solution with oh you are already doing that no 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 I, well so the problem is we we're actually making the problem worse first of all right because we're using a whole library of possible terms rather than like a specific model that we can simplify so things have gotten bad in terms of identifiability. And we know we've made it worse. And the way that we're trying to make it better is imposing the sparsity constraint, right? And so the question is how, I think the question is how can we, given that we know that we've really made identifiability worse, use the sparsity constraint and combine that with some something, and there's multiple ways to do this, you could do it in the way that you sample your, your, you initialize, you can do it in the way that you implement the sparsity constraint, but do that so that you are making it simpler. But you could also make another thing, you could make the problem simpler by saying, I consider fewer data, so I have fewer constraints to make it work. And that could already kind of reduce some of the possibilities and then you add another one. So now you have more constraints. I mean, the, yeah, the other thing we're thinking about is like, okay, well, what if simpler models will will work for certain subsets of the data? Um, yes. We're, we're there, so like if you're in an isomptotic limit and you only have data in that isomptotic limit, then you can find a lower dimensional structure in your data. And so you can find that instead of the full thing. I say that like we're like active. I, I I agree is the comment. We don't we don't have a solution of exactly how to do it yet. Thank you. <laughs> it's good. It's so good. Um, very fascinating work. Um, you worked with undergraduates as well, yes. um, right? And so I'm wondering where how you recruited them and how in that process how much did they learn from each other and from the IDPH, for example. Yeah, so um, uh, how we recruited the undergrads for the public health projects is very different from how I typically recruit undergrads, which is we had um, funding for this project. And so we, you know, we were looking for undergrads that had specific, like very strong coding and an interest in the public health. And we sent out, you know, we wrote up a little ad and sent it out to the computer science, uh, applied math and IEMS department student listservs and then we interviewed them and like did the whole sort of a standard it was more like hiring people less like there was a a training program or something that they were involved in um in terms of what their interaction with the public health departments i think that a couple of times as they have got so caitlin has managed most of this i think a couple of times as they've had results that were relevant, they've been invited to those meetings and maybe a couple of them have presented, but a lot, most of their work has been, they have been um, working directly with Caitlin and then a, coming to our subgroup meetings, uh, both to see what other people are doing and to present their own work is the main mode of operation. Did that answer? Were there other, other okay. 
and others will have to wait for afterwards. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that the uh, the model that you came out with was consistent with the this depleted metabolite theory of of wakes from hibernation. I'm wondering, are there other theories that this model would rule out? Cody. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think my expectation is we're probably going to find more models that can do this spiking behavior, right? Like there's a lot of classes of models that can create the spiking behavior. So my bias is I will be surprised if we can't find more models, like if Daisy doesn't find more models. One of the things is that a lot of the existing models that do this spiking behavior are three-dimensional and we restricted our, we did some data characterization and found that the data was intrinsically either two-dimensional or, or maybe three-dimensional. And so because of that, we started with the two-dimensional search. Uh, so Andrew is currently doing the three-dimensional search, and that's where I think it would be likely that we would pop out a different model that would be more consistent with the other hypotheses in the literature. then it could be that something as simple as glucose levels. So you have a few places where you measure it. Maybe that's a key thing. Maybe the glucose is not the thing, but maybe an analysis of club that we are four points in the, the thing that you are doing. Okay. So you see the answer. That's why, yeah, that's why it is a biological hypothesis. Like all the paper, the biology papers are doing that, right? Like they're trying to figure out. Why don't we stop there? If Neil has a few more minutes, maybe she can answer questions, but let's, uh, everyone needs to go past the time limit. So let's thank Neil again. Mm -hmm.